Hey, this is John Buck. I'm back uh, with another array signal processing video. This one is sort of chapter two in the story of how we think about uh, array si uh, signal processing in a frequency domain perspective. This assumes you've already watched step one in this video. Uh, so if you haven't, uh, if you're just finding this on YouTube, I'd suggest go back and look for the conceptual overview before you get into the math here. But again, what we're going to do, I'm going to take us on what appears to be a detour, reviewing things from filtering in time and frequency, and then subversively have ulterior motives to bring us back to, to uh, show how this does connect to array pro the array processing beamformers we've already been talking about. Right, one of the most important results in DSP or discrete time signals uh, is that if I convolve two signals x of n and h of n, uh, shown here on the, on the left-hand column, to get an output y of n, and here's the convolution sum written out, the Fourier transform tells me this complicated convolution sum in time it can also be shown to be equivalent to this very simple operation in frequency, which is to say that I take the input at each frequency omega and multiply it by the frequency response of that omega to get the output at that omega. Right, and so these two are equivalent. I can work back and forth between these two things. So let me uh, let me tell you a little bit of, let's, let's think of a case here. Say, imagine, rather than finding, if I do a convolution, normally I get a whole output signal over a wide range of time. But suppose I only want the output at time at n equals zero. How can that simplify things in both sides of this picture? Well, you say that kind of, kind of crazy, John. I normally have a big signal. Why would I just worry about one sample? But I'm like, go with me and work with me on this. You'll see there's, there's a reason for this. We'd say, well, I can write my convolution sum as the sum over m, this is just sort of my dummy index variable, of h of minus m x of m. And if I think about the, the Fourier representation of this, right, we'd say I'd write that y of n is the inverse Fourier transform integral. So I have 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of, of the Fourier transform yb to the j omega times e to the j omega m, these are my basis functions or ingredients that I'm making y of n out of, times d omega. So if I set n equal to zero, I can simplify this integral somewhat. Right, I get one over two pi times the integral from minus pi to pi of y v to the j omega. And now when n is zero, this, this uh, term here just becomes a one, right? Because when e to the zero is one, so I can leave that out of my integral and I just have d omega here. And now substituting this thing in from the, the expression for the, the uh, filtering and frequency, I can say, so this is this output in terms of the frequency domain is saying I could take my input Fourier transform times my filter Fourier transform. That would give me y v to the j omega. So I'd have this all spread out as a function of omega. And then I basically just integrate over the omega axis from minus pi to pi, and that gives me the output, or the output y just at that one sample zero I'm interested in. Right, so that uh, that's the, the time domain zero situation. Now, what are, what's going on at y of zero? I've got these two things I could say they're equal to each other, if I wanted to do it this way. But but imagine we say, well, let's let's not. This has been a general convolution thing. Let's make some assumptions. What if we assume my filter is a finite length filter and it's centered between plus and minus some value n sub c, right? So if I were to sketch my filter out on the time axis, I sort of drew it silhouette. I have this finite impulse FIR filter I'm convolving with between plus and minus NC. Right, so if I do that, I can simplify the sum here to only go between plus and minus NC because that's the only place where H is non-zero. 
and now let me make one other thing and say, well, suppose I set h of minus m equal to my array weight vector for my beam former conjugated. Right? Then if I do that, then this, this oh, I forgot this is at time zero, then this, if I do this and substitute it in here, what this is telling me is that this filter output at time zero is the sum from minus nc to plus nc of wm conjugate of m. And you know, maybe to emphasize the filtering part, we'll do this. We'll write it like a sequence. So we'll write this as w star of m. So that's the mth element of the vector w conjugated times x of m. Well, if this is my input phasor vector I showed in the first video, then these are my array weights. Then I've just shown that the, the output, just this one sample of the output, is that complex scalar that's the output of my beamformer. I've sort of massaged these two things to be the same. So what does that tell me is going on in the frequency domain? Well, I can say if I want to think about the other side of things, then this x of e to the j omega is the Fourier transform of my complex phasor input vector. Well, that's the scanned response. And I need to do a little, use a, a little bit of my, my Fourier uh, uh, kung fu here on x of h of e to the j omega to get the, the result there. Right, so if I have h of m equal to this, I'm saying, well, oops, wrong color. This is the same as saying my filter impulse response is equal to my array weight vector of minus m conjugated. Again, for, we're doing this in this region centered on the origin between plus and minus nc. So I'm saying my, my impulse response is this. Well, using uh, Fourier properties, if, right, if I take the Fourier transform of something that has been both flipped in time and conjugated, what I end up getting back is its Fourier transform uh, <clears throat> just conjugated. Because right, it turns out when I flip it in time, I flip it in frequency. When I conjugate it, I conjugate it and flip it in frequency. So the two frequency flips undo each other, and I'm just left with a conjugate. If you're not that familiar with those Fourier properties, good excuse to go uh, pull out your favorite DSP textbook and look up the table of Fourier transform properties. Or it doesn't take too long to prove that on a piece of scrap paper on the side. But so the idea here is, is what we've just shown is that the... Uh, Fourier transform, so Fourier transform of this is the Fourier transform of H, so we've just shown that the frequency response in the time domain sense is equal to the what I would get if I took the Fourier transform of the weight vector, Wm, and took its conjugate. So putting that in, it's telling me that the beamformer output, right, y of zero here, my beamformer output, if I bring it down here, I can also write it, the y of zero, is 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi, of <clears throat> the Fourier transform of the input vector of m or of these n complex values representing the observed signal times w conjugate of e to the j omega, d omega. And so that's the, the result. And just sort of, again, breaking this down, so the Fourier transform of my input vector, this is the scanned response. And this is the uh, beam pattern with the conjugate. Now when we look at a beam pattern, the conjugate's a little worrying, and, and this is saying I'm going to multiply these two things together and then integrate, that is, add them up over all the possible frequencies, which is all the possible plane waves. So my output, you know, I won't get to see the individual omegas. This is telling me my output is a, a combination, a sum of the energy from all these different plane waves put together 
<clears throat> uh, with, with this integral. And if I use my, if, as I said earlier, I often do this in terms of u, if I let, use my change of variables where I, if I have a standard array with d is lambda over 2, then uh, u equals cos theta tells me that uh, psi is the analogous variable for the array. So this omega would be like pi times u. I can replace this, so I could, just to keep it simple, I'll call that big omega. I could replace this with a change of variables in my integral, and I'll end up with one half the integral from minus one to one, if I write all this in terms of u, of my scanned response as a function of u. Make that clear, it's a u, not a w. Times the conjugate of my beam pattern as a function of u, du. Now when I, I think about things like beam patterns, the first most important thing I usually worry about more is the magnitude than the, than the frequency, right? I'm saying my output is the sum of all these energies. I would have to worry about, these things are all complex quantities, so I might have energy coming from one U that has a different phase than energy coming from another U by the time it gets to the beam former, and they could be canceling out. But to first order, I often just think about this if I want to plot these things as magnitudes. Uh, to, to keep track of what's going on, I can say, well, you know, what's the magnitude? How much energy will be coming, will be in my output? Will I have a lot of energy for this filter or not a lot of energy? And so if I, if I take the magnitude of both sides, I can say it's a half times, I bring the, I have, still have the magnitude of the integral. I have to be careful because an integral is like a sum. And since these are complex numbers, I can't just say that Right, this, the magnitude of a sum is not the sum of the magnitudes, but it's less than them. So I can at least get an idea for a lot of simple inputs. I can say, well, the energy in my output will be at, you know, bounded above by the, you know, the magnitude of the integral is less than the integral of the magnitudes, because this is what would happen if they all reinforce in phase. And then I can use the fact that I have a magnitude of a product to write this as the product of the magnitudes. So what I'm often going to do to look at things is look at a magnitude of the scanned response and a magnitude, well, if I take the magnitude of a conjugate, it's unchanged, right? The magnitude of W star is the same as the magnitude of W. So it's saying I can get a, a rough upper bound on how much energy will be in my output for a given filter and a given input by taking their magnitudes and multiplying them together and then thinking about combining it. Now, if, if this says the beam patterns are removing everything, it'll be small and the output will be pretty small. It might not be as much as I think. If I have multiple input signals, this is sort of, this may be overestimating how much energy will be there, but it's a good place to start to build on our intuition with this idea that I can multiply things together with scanned responses and beam patterns, particularly their magnitudes, and get an, a rough idea of how the filter is behaving. So if I think about this here, if I have sketched in white a typical beam pattern looking to broadside, and, and suppose my scanned response had two signals in it. My desired signal here is, is the green thing at broadside, and then I have some other interfere out here I don't want at, at some other location, and this is my u-axis going from minus one to one. So maybe I'll call this u sub i for my interfere. So I'm saying if I take my broadside beam former and process this array data with it, what will happen is that this signal would pass unchanged, right? And the reason it would pass unchanged is that I have a gain of, of one for the beam pattern here. So I multiply x times the gain of one for the beam pattern. This is, this is my magnitude w of u. And then I have magnitude x of u. My, uh, this, this thing will be scaled, right? If this were a, a, a sync beam pattern, this thing would be less than 120th. So we'll call it 120th. So this would be attenuated by a factor of 20, my output would have the energy from both, but it would be really clearly seeing this as I swept across looking at different directions. If I played different filters on it, I would I would see that. You know, if I picked a different filter, you know, maybe I have an, another filter. If I steered my filter over here, that would look something like this. We can see, well, when I multiply this beam pattern, the blue beam pattern by these signals, they would be completely removed. So it's as if the filter that steered sort of in this, we'll call it the U2 direction, like when I built a different beam former steered in this direction, I'd have almost no energy coming out, and I could see that because I've got essentially zero here and here. 
So by thinking about this, I can get a sense of which energy is going to get through the filter before it gets all added up by this integration in U to tell me how much energy is in the output. I can at least bound it using the same story. All right, so I'll stop here. Big picture idea though, multiplying scanned response by beam patterns is like multiplying a Fourier transform of the input with a frequency response. And I can use those same intuitions uh, to, to, to think about how a beamformer is going to operate or, or maybe a bunch of different beamformers are going to operate by looking at different beam patterns applied to a scanned response. All right, I'll uh, stop here and I'll see you in class.